Well, this last week, I was, Amanda and I were really, really provoked by last week's message when Pastor Ron preached on this message called Parenting with Guts. I just love the title, but, but also the content was very provoking. It was one of them sobering, sobering messages that as parents, and Amanda and I were in the thick of it with, you know, 10, 8, 5, and 3, just the, the pressure of culture and where it is today, and this can apply to so many of us, whether or not you're in that phase of life or not, because it, it applies to having an impact on coworkers at work, neighbors, grandkids. And as I thought about it all week, just the issues that Pastor Ron kind of exposed to us, the lack of respect and how many other things are really seeking to grab our kids' lives and capture their attention and, and basically do the job of discipleship for us. I, I realized that, you know, I'm all about parenting skills. I'm the kind of guy, I'll read all the books and I, I love to glean. When I meet with whoever, I ask tons of questions because I really value learning from those that have gone before me. And I'm all about that. I will glean and I want more tools and more skills. But this issue of getting more, a few more parenting skills or more skills to impact your coworker, to have any kind of impact in society of where we are right now, it's gonna take more than skills. It's gonna take more than having a few more tools. We need to engage God with our hearts. There has to be a true awakening in our heart of engaging God with our hearts and when that is in place, the tools that we do have and that we are equipped with to make an impact with our kids, neighbors, coworkers, et cetera, it'll go deeper and further. The impact will go deeper and further. We will be more relevant. We will be a better service to those around us as we love and serve them when our hearts are fully engaged. And I, this was the phrase all week as I thought about this, which propelled me into these this message, it's this, it's all about the heart. All of it is. I can hear just the, the, the whisper of the Lord speaking to me. Wes, it's all about the heart. You have to get your heart engaged with me in order for your parenting as a dad to have impact upon your kids. Your heart has to be in the game. Now, here's a verse that bothers me. It's Jeremiah 17 verse nine. The heart is deceitful above all things. It's desperately wicked is what the scripture says. Who can know it? Even those of us that have been on the journey of Christianity for some time, our hearts still creep up and shock us sometimes. We're like, ah, I can't believe that those desires and some of those things actually are still in me, even after walking with the Lord for some time. It's true. The Bible says the heart is deceitful. The heart is wicked. We have fallen so far from where God had created and intended us to be. But here's the good news, is that the Lord is committed to us. The Lord in his abundance of grace and wisdom and insight and his willingness to confront us, he's committed to helping our hearts be engaged in a right way. Our hearts to be full of tenderness and humility and kindness the kind of heart that brings impact, whether it's in parenting, again, at work, neighbors, classmates, etc. We are in need of a transformation. We are in need of our hearts to be truly engaged with the Lord. Well, how do we get there? How do we get our hearts to be turned towards God so that our, our attempts at parenting, our attempts of impacting a, a coworker, etc., will have impact and lasting impact? I'm gonna talk a little bit about this. I think one, is this issue right here, it's the command in scripture to worship God. This command in scripture to worship God is from Genesis to Revelation. Or if you've got certain Bibles, it's Genesis to Maps. You know, that, that fits right in there after Revelation. That's in there too. So all throughout the scriptures, this command is crystal clear. Worship God. You see it in John in Revelation, the very end of the book, the angels are telling John, worship him. You see it in the psalmist. You see it in the, in the early patriarchs. Worship God. 
Here's a couple of verses, Psalm 96, verse nine. It says, oh, worship the Lord and the beauty of holiness. Tremble or fear him is another translation. Not, not in a sense of fearing an evil dictator like he's some kind of schizophrenic person and you don't, know, you don't quite know what kind of mood he's gonna be in today. It's not that kind of fear. It's more of a reverence. Revere him. All of the earth, it says, Psalm 99, nine. It says, exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy hill. For the Lord our God is holy. And again, this is a constant theme. It's a command of the scriptures saying, worship him. Now worship can be expressed in many ways. Ultimately, the worship that God is looking for is worship that comes from deep within. It's from our heart. It's wrapped in sincerity, it's sincere. There's a, a real genuine reach for God that is found in true worship. It's wrapped in humility, that humility that we choose to put on. Because hum, you know, humility isn't just something that naturally comes. Just hang out with kids for a little bit. We'll see that we have, we have lost all capacity of humility. Humility is something that we grow in and we continually choose to do to put on humility. It's an act of worship, sincerity. It's from the heart though, it's deep within. To worship God is to love God, to honor God. Ultimately, it's committing to obey God no matter the cost. But again, it's from the heart. It's from the heart, it's not outward appearance, it's not behavioral modification, it's not externals, it's deep within. This is how, and this is what the, the Bible is calling us to when it says worship God, it's from the heart. Now, God sees the heart. He has the ability to see within and through all of the commotion and motion. And the reason I bring this up is because sometimes we deceive ourselves. Sometimes we think that as long as we have everything in order externally on the outside, that we're living a life of worship. And sometimes on the opposite end of the spectrum, our life on the outside is a complete mess and we feel like we can't worship God at all and that we're not worthy to worship him. But let's look at two scenarios that help us with this truth that God sees our heart. And the reason that he, he wants to highlight in the scripture that he sees our heart is because he's committed to help us to be a person that truly worships him with our heart in honesty and in, in genuineness where it's real, it's authentic. Two stories, John 8. In John 8, God reveals this side of things when somebody has it all in order. And on the outside, they look as if they are a person of worship, a person of obedience, a person with everything in order. The group he uses in John 8 to make this example are the religious elite. Now, let's just make sure we know who we're talking about. These are guys memorizing scripture. More scripts than probably any of us in this room could come up with. These guys knew scripture forwards and backwards. They fasted every day, or, or they fasted one day a week. They gave money religiously, meaning in a very consistent way, they were giving of their money. They were doing uh, public ministries to impact other people. So outwardly, you and I, we would look at them from the external and say, man, they got it going on. We'd probably feel a little convicted, a little bad about our own spirituality and our own walk with Christ. We would look at them and think, man, they got everything in order. They must be really a person of worship but they had a huge problem. And you'll read about this in John 8. Jesus comes forth, because here's what God has the ability to do. He can look right through all of the commotion and motion in our life. He looks right through the outside. Now you and I, we have a problem doing that a lot of times, but he doesn't. He looks right through, whew, deep within here, when everything in here is exposed. And here's what he tells this religious group that was seemingly perfect on the outside. He says, you got a huge problem, here it is. Your father is the devil. <laughs> I mean, just smacking me now and wake me up because that's what it's supposed to do. We're thinking, what? I, I, I think you meant the guys behind him. You must have been looking behind them, surely not them. He says, no, 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 I'm talking about them. Yeah, on the outside, they have everything in order, seemingly. 
Everything is in place. They, they look the part. They say the right things. They know when to say the right things. And sometimes we parent from that perspective. And we put more emphasis on our kids, making sure they know what to say and when to say it. But sometimes that can be a very bad way of parenting if our hearts are not engaged with the Lord. Jesus looks at them and he peers through the truth and he says, guys, you're, you're not even in the game. And you're not deceiving me and you need to wake up to it. And sometimes we need that wake up call. I have found in phases of my life and different seasons of my life, I need that confrontation. When the Lord would speak to me and shock me, I always, when I come around passages like this, I always say, Lord, shock me now. Be honest with me. Let me not just be a professional Christian that makes sure you know, that everything on the outside is packaged just right so that you all think that I'm on the right track. Because at the end of the day, your opinion really doesn't matter. At the end of the day, it's the Lord peering through my heart and I want him to see a heart. It's all about the heart that is worshiping the Lord. But now here is the opposite end. Let's go over on this side. This one is in Luke 18. He gives another example because sometimes we relate to this side. And this side is when our, our life is a complete mess. We don't know where our Bibles are. We don't know the last time we've been able to make it out the door. This is happening, this is happening. We've been in the flesh all week. We've got mad, we got angry. We're all of these things. Our life seems to be just falling apart in chaos. And we find ourselves, and this man in Luke 18, he's beating himself in the chest and he's saying, Lord, I am unworthy of your love. I don't even deserve for you to look at me. I don't deserve to even be called a worshiper, or be called a believer, or to be attached to your name at all. I'm a wicked man. My life's a mess, look at me. We would look at those people a lot to feel better about our own spirituality. We look at them and say, oh, I'm doing a lot better than them, praise God. But here's what Jesus does, again, because he has the ability to do this. He moves it all out, he parts the ways, and he looks right into the heart. And in Luke 18, here's what he says about this man. He says, this man's a true worshiper. He says, this man is sincere in his heart. He says, he is justified before my father. See, God sees the heart. Sometimes we can relate to both of these camps. But here's the point. It's all about the heart. We as believers that, seek, that we're seeking to have impact upon other people, our impact is directly related to whether or not our hearts are in the game, that we're connected with God. And God says, worship me from your heart. Don't be so focused on all of your outward behaviors and forsake the real stuff which is in here. Let in here be real with me and genuine. And what'll happen is on the outside in due time will line up. In due time, the outside will be in order. But we must focus upon our hearts engaging with the Lord. Well, let's look at two reasons of why God is worthy of worship. Because if the Bible is going to command us to worship, which, you know, there's many reasons why, but again, one of the reasons is to engage our hearts with Him. Because it's impossible to worship God from the heart and your heart over time not being tenderized. It's impossible. I mean, when you worship God from your heart, and you can do this anywhere. This isn't just in the midst of a worship service at church. It's at home, it's private. Sometimes there's music, sometimes there's no music. It's not about singing. This is about it connecting with God. Sometimes it's just a, a, a 10 second little moment throughout the day. And what happens when we connect with him in a, in a moment of worship, your heart is tenderized. It's tenderized. You're made more gentle, more kind. When you are more gentle and more kind and more godly, your impact in parenting or a coworker, a neighbor, etc., goes further and deeper. So there's a lot of wisdom in this command to worship God, a lot of wisdom. But here's two reasons why. Number one, one of my favorite reasons, is the power and glory of God demand it. Let me say that again, the power and the glory that God possesses demand a response of worship. And I'm not talking about a demand that is, again, this evil dictator that says, hey, 
you right there, you better do this or I will. And that's not the demand I'm speaking of. I'm speaking of the demand of like when you see the Grand Canyon for the first time in person. Or remember the first time in, in, in when I was a little kid and born and raised here in the Midwest and I finally make it down to the coast and I see the ocean for the first time. And we're driving along the highway and your, your face is planted to the glass. Or when you're cruising across I-70 across Kansas and it's just like a sheet of paper for hours and hours and hours. And then you hit Colorado for the first time. Again, your face is planted to the glass. It's reverence. It's awe. This is the demand I'm speaking of. When we see the glory and the beauty, the power that God possesses, it puts a demand upon us to respond in worship. We're not speaking of normal power, but an entirely different category. It's unlimited. His power is unlimited. There's no way you can measure it. I mean, think of the most powerful person that we could ever come up with, and it's measurable. You can measure the, his influence, the, the, the length of his influence, his, the length of their in, the wealth or whatever it is that we wanna relate the power to. But God's is unlimited, it's undefined. Words like splendor, majestic, wonderful, awesome, those are good attempts, but they're only attempts. They still don't do God justice when trying to explain him and describe the power that he possesses. Psalm 145, five, it says, I will meditate on the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works. The reason that the psalmist is meditating on it is because he realizes he doesn't get it. Looking up at the vast wealth of God's creation and the power and the, the wisdom, the genius that God must possess, that must possess to, to create even the details of humanity, let alone all the other species and all of the other details of creation. The psalmist says, I have to intentionally fill my mind with these truths because it's glorious, the splendor that you possess. This is why we see tens of thousands of angels in the scriptures worshiping and ministering to God. They see what he's capable of doing up close. Angels see the creative power of God and his ability to sustain all that he has created. They see his beauty up close, the majesty that surrounds him. Psalm 104, it says, O Lord, my God, you are very great. Now, that statement coming from the mind isn't that great. It's not like a, uh, but when that statement comes from here, it's an exclamation of praise. Oh, Lord, my God, you are very great. I cannot comprehend your greatness. This is where the psalmist is coming from. He says, you clothe yourself with splendor and majesty. Splendor is beauty. Covering yourself with light as a garment, a light that demands worship, a, a light that attracts, a light that when you see this beautiful light of God, this glory, it's like you get fixated and you can't move. You're stunned. Now we can relate to that a little bit from when we see beautiful things. When we see things of beauty, we are captured for a moment. Beloved, when we see uncreated beauty, the founder of beauty, the designer of beauty, I mean, think of his mind that he must possess to create even the idea of beauty. He is splendor, he is majestic, he's beauty himself. The angels surround him in worship. Daniel 7 verse 10, it says, a fiery stream issued and came before him. Daniel having a, a heavenly vision. He said a thousand thousands ministered to him. 10, Thousand times 10,000 stood before him in awe and worship. Revelation 5, verse 11, John sees the, the same vision that Daniel saw. He says, I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around God's throne where God was seated. And he said, the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000. Oh, it was thousands of thousands is what John goes on to say. As far as I could see, a sea of angelic host worshiping God. The seraphim, these are the six winged creatures that we see only twice in scripture, they're called the seraphim. We see them in Isaiah six, 
and we see them in Revelation 4. Now, Isaiah sees them in Isaiah 6. 800 years later, John sees them. Now, scholars debate, are these angels? Are these, they say that they're living creatures is the way that they're described in Scripture. The scholars think, they don't know what they are. It's some kind of created being that God has created, and they surround the very throne of God. They're the only angels or the only creatures that are mentioned to have six wings. John says that they have eyes all around and within. Now get this for a moment. Just track with me. Isaiah 6, 800 years later, Revelation 4. 800 years. And when Isaiah sees them, they're singing, Holy, 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 holy. He is holy. He is holy. 800 years later, John sees them in Revelation 4. They're still stuck on the same word. They're singing, holy, holy, holy. John adds that they have eyes all around and within as they gaze at God and exclaim what they see. Beauty, full of majesty. But yeah, beloved, he's holy. He's holy. Our prayer many times is, Lord, let us see what they see. Let us see the glory that you possess. When I think of Ezekiel, it's one of my favorite books. It's a bizarre book, some of the things written in the book of Ezekiel. But Ezekiel chapter one, verse one. It's a favorite, one of my favorite verses. Here's how it starts. Ezekiel chapter one, verse one. You can, I think it's in the notes, but you can look at it in your, in your Bible as well. It says, the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. This is Ezekiel. At the time, he's a prisoner. He's a prisoner outside of, of Babylon. He'd just been taken captive from Jerusalem. And he says, I saw visions of God because the heavens were open. He goes on to explain what he sees. And when you, when you read descriptions of God in the scriptures, where prophets or, or saints of old, they have these heavenly-like visitations, and they're beginning, they're attempting to explain what they see. You'll see the, the word like used a lot. He was like this. He was like that. They were like this. And it's because he's wholly other than. He's completely other than anything that we could relate to. I mean, how do you begin to explain a God that has no beginning? Because every word that we would use has a beginning. Every word, every adjective that we would attempt to use has a word that is connected to something that is created. But how do you explain and describe a God that has no beginning? Every word will fall short. You use the word like, that's what you do. The prophets, every other word, he was like this, he was like that. I can imagine the brains fry. Ah, he was like this. But Ezekiel, Ezekiel 1, the heavens were open and I saw visions of God. Chapter three, verse 15, is when he's ending his attempt of describing all that he's seen and heard. I love verse 15. And it says, Ezekiel, he sat among the other prisoners astonished for seven days by the riverside. So when was the last time, <clears throat> date night, you went to the killer new release from <clears throat> Hollywood, box office movie, AMC. You go in, you get your pop, get your date, get your popcorn. You watch this awesome movie. You've heard so much about it. After the movie, you and your date or your wife, you go out, you sit in your car, and you sit there seven days astonished of what you just saw. <laughs> Awestruck. I can't, I can't even talk. This is basically what Ezekiel does in Ezekiel 3. It says, for seven days, the things that he saw and heard left him astonished. Again, God's beauty and glory demand worship. The angels surround him in worship. And here's what is so obvious. You see, the angels, they can't relate to us worshiping on the fact that our sins have been forgiven. See, we have a whole lot more reasons to worship than the angels do. The angels can't relate to the fact that they've had their sins forgiven. 
They can't relate to the point on a day when you felt hopeless and suddenly you were strengthened with hope. When a word of encouragement came just in time, the breakthrough of God and provision for your family. A lost loved one is brought back to the family and born again and over and over and over when God relates and connects to to us in the details of our life. The angels have no grid except for watching it. They can't relate to the heart issue of it. And yet the angels are worshiping simply because God's power and glory demand it. God is beyond, he's far beyond anything we can imagine. When we peer into any of these truths, we are left speechless. He's beyond anything we can imagine in glory and beauty and power and might. Paul in Romans 11, when he's caught up with these truths, this comes out of him. He says, oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his ways and his ways past finding out. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Meaning that his mind is so incredibly brilliant. It's so incredibly filled with thoughts about us. It's so incredibly filled with wisdom to create the greatest amount of worship within our hearts. He says his mind is filled with brilliance. Paul was caught in a moment of worship. See that that exclamation there in Romans 11, that's not an intellectual thing. It's something that we possess within here. It's all about the heart, guys. It's all about the heart. We have to fight for our hearts to be engaged with God. Let's not settle going through the motions. If we settle going through the motions, our impact will remain what it is. And we will continue to see our kids being schooled in religion, but not being schooled in a relationship of encountering God at the heart level. My prayer for my children, because I'm a, a, a pastor, I don't want them to learn professional Christianity. I don't, I, I, my prayer all the time for my kids and your kids is God, spare them from lifeless religion. Spare them from knowing what to say and going through the motions, yet have no heart connected to it at all. This is not what we wanna pass down. This is not what we want our fingerprint to be upon other people. Our heart has to be engaged with God. Come on, come on, amen? Now well, this is what we're committing to. That wasn't good enough, come on, amen? Come on, thank you. Isaiah 40, Isaiah, he continues, he says, to whom then, as Isaiah is having this conversation with the Lord, the Lord says, to whom then will you liken me? I can imagine with this big smile of God on his face. So there, little man, who are you gonna compare me to? Give it a shot. Who will you liken me to? What brilliant person can compete with my brilliance? What powerful man can even be on the same level, let alone in the same sentence of conversation with the power that I possess. He says, to whom then shall I be equal, says the Holy One. He says, lift up your eyes on high. As he's outside looking at the vast creation of the cosmos and the stars, he says, see who has created all of these things. Speaking of the stars and the galaxies, who brings them out by number. He calls them all by name and he's done it by the greatness of his might and the strength of his power. Have you not known, have you not heard the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth? His understanding is unsearchable. Now, Louis Giglio is a guy, he's been a voice in our generation for many years. And one of the gifts that he has been to the body of Christ is helping us get a grid, a better grid of the greatness and power of God. I wanna watch a short clip of this kind of reality. Come on. You know, I, I put Louis's uh, web address in your notes. I wanna really encourage you, if, you know, if, if you've heard of him and some of those teachings or you haven't, you can, hear so many messages. Again, one of the gifts that he's been to the body 
is to help us elevate our understanding of the greatness and magnitude of God. Because when we have a right view of God's majesty and power, our hearts are awed. We are moved in worship and honor and reverence before a, a holy God. Now, number two reason of why God is worthy of worship is what he does with this power. This is what the angels can't relate to. The use of God's power provokes worship. He uses his power to serve mankind. He forgives sinners. He gives hope to the hopeless. He heals, protects, provides. He fathers those that will turn to him. I mean, think about it, the greatest seat of power, the greatest position of honor, unlimited glory, it, having the ability and the knowledge and the resources to do anything. And yet what he does with this power provokes worship. Again, it's through the scriptures, this is why it's right. The exclamation, the command of worship God. It's because he's worthy. Now, let's not forget when we think about the gospel of Jesus, that, that even that, that little video of Louis showing the grand creation of the cosmos and where this little blue dot, the earth fits in, which is our story. The one who created, the one who spoke a word and created the vast universe. In the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, when we read about the man, Christ Jesus, it's no ordinary man. He ain't just a prophet that knew a few things insightful about the future. He wasn't just an anointed Bible teacher. He was God in the flesh. When we think of the grand power majesty of God and then whew, right there in a little human form. I mean, I can imagine the angels are passing out. I mean, they're just like, what? The grand God of creation becomes a fetus in the belly of a woman born of a virgin, living a normal life in a little obscure place north of Jerusalem in Nazareth. I mean, I'm thinking, I always think of this, the kids at 10 years old out playing soccer with the creator God, the one who created them. Whether or not they realize that or not, probably not, but this is no ordinary man we're speaking of. This is what sets Christianity apart from any other religion, is that we, our claim is that our Savior and our Lord is the God of the universe the Holy Trinity, three in one, God the Creator and the Father, and Jesus the Son by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now here's what he does to provoke worship. He comes to serve. Let's look at these passages of scripture and look at the, the common theme of what he does with this position of power. The first thing he does, John three sixteen. for God so loved the world, there it is, the phrase. In my Bible, I have it circled because this tells me what this infinite God is like, and it reminds Wes of another reason of why he's worthy of my worship. He came, and it says that he gave. This was a pricely gift, this one was, the life of his son. He gave, position of power, do whatever he wants. Position of the creator, the ruler, and yet he uses that power, I'm gonna give you my son so that you may have life so that you can have everlasting life, to be saved through him. John 1, here it is again. As many as receive him, to them, there it is again, he gave. The God who gives, the God who doesn't have to do anything, possesses all power, all wisdom, all knowledge, and yet he chooses to be a generous God that gives the right to become children of God, John 1, 12. John 4, verse 14, Whoever drinks of the water that I, here it is again, shall give. I give. He's speaking of spiritual life here. I will give him and he will never thirst. The water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. He's speaking here of spiritual life, which means this. I will give peace. I will give hope. I will give forgiveness, goodness, life. I am gracious in my very existence, all of the goodness that I possess, I will put it in you and you'll be able to feel it. You'll be able to feel whole. You'll be able to feel unshakable, immovable. You'll be able to feel what he intended us to feel as humans. 
the God who gives. John 5, verse 24, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Speaking of spiritual death and spiritual life, I will give life to the dead. This is what God does sitting on the most powerful seat of all, possessing all glory, already worthy of worship simply because of the power he possesses. But he says, I- I'm gonna take it a step further. I'm gonna reveal the, the goodness behind the power. I'm gonna reveal the kind of nature that I have. And I'm gonna display it on a cross. I mean, again, I think of the magnitude of creation. Speaking of the power of God. And the cross reveals the nature this God possesses. Beloved. That's why the psalmist would cry out in worship. That's why Paul and Peter, Isaiah, David, all throughout church history, when one see him rightly, a proclamation of praise. The essence of the gospel of Jesus is that God, who possesses all power and authority, gave up his life that we might live. This great act of selfless love provokes worship. It provokes adoration and thanksgiving within all of us. And here's the promise of scripture. We worship God with our hearts. We connect with him in our hearts, our impact within our children, coworkers, neighbors. It'll go deeper, it'll go further. It's all about the heart.